a modern day Glass Steagall Act has continued to attract support. The main benefit this would bring relative to structural ring fencing is that it would eliminate loopholes from the ring fence and better ensure that the distinct cultures of retail and investment banking were not cross contaminated. That would lessen the risk of banking activities uh, being starved of human or financial capital both ahead of and during crisis. Full separation may also be operationally simpler to implement than the existing structural proposals. Uh, I must say that I am completely convinced by that, and, and you are pointing in uh, a very clear direction. However, only four days later, you seem to me to be slightly rowing back from that. And again, I quote in the, the speech you made four days later, another good speech. There are, and I quote, there are those who doubt whether a ring fence is sufficient to achieve that cultural separation in banking. Can two separate subcultures really operate underneath a single roof? Time will tell. If it is not possible, then full separation would be the logical next step. Do you not think on reflection that's a little bit dangerous? Um, not only did you in your first quotation point out the greater advantages of complete separation, complete structural separation, but time will tell means we will know with the next disaster that it hasn't worked. Isn't that a little bit dangerous? Mm. So maybe a few points on that if I can, Lord Lawson. So, um, so I do think um, that um, the single most important thing, the single most important thing that could be done to achieve this um, cultural transformation would be the structural measures that you refer to there. It won't by itself be the single thing that unlocks the key, but for me it, it would be the most important thing that could be done. Um, I also think that the, the ICB, the John Vickers Commission proposals, take us you know, very much in the right direction and a lot of the distance uh, towards achieving some of the objectives of that separation. And we are strongly of the view, I'm strongly of the view, that full and faithful implementation of Vickers would be a significantly positive, significantly positive step. Um, there are questions about whether while necessary that is sufficient. Um, and let me make maybe a point about um, where the boundary is drawn, where the ring fence is drawn, and what might be needed to achieve the benefits of, the proper benefits of, of ring fencing and to minimize loophole risk. So um, on the uh, question of where the ring fence should be placed, um, I think the Vickers Commission is right in focusing on those activities that lie within the ring fence. Other proposals, Volker and Lickenham, tend, uh, tend to spend greater focus on the, if you like, investment banking side of the fence. I think um, John and colleagues were right to focus on those activities that you would want to have available on a continuous basis. That's the right principle to think about where the, the fence should be uh, placed. I do think that there's a strong case for um, thinking about a broader set of activities as being mandated to lie inside that fence. So you may recall that currently the Vickers Proposals has three categories of activity. Those that are mandated within the fence, those that are prohibited from lying within the ring fence, and a big third category, a grey area, which are permitted activities. I think that grey area carries risks. It's the risks of flexibility. And flexibility in the context of a ring fence is for me somewhat perilous. Um, now, I know that the banks were here on Monday, and they quite like the notion of flexibility to fit their business model. Yeah, they would. The question is, for us, from a prudential perspective, is flexibility our friend? And previous ring fences, as Paul Volcker said, have tended to prove permeable when they have too much flex in them. 
and that I think is a risk. So personally, um, I think there is a case for thinking whether the set of mandated activities inside the ring fence ought to be broader. For example, currently, loans to SMEs, trade finance, mortgages are not mandated to lie within the ring fence. They are all activities, I think, that we would view as needing to remain in continuous service if a bank were to get into trouble. So I would personally prefer a somewhat clearer ring fence, less grey zone, drawn in a somewhat different place than is the case currently uh, under the Vickers proposals. Thank you. Well, precisely where the dividing line is drawn mm. is obviously very important. Uh, but what I would like to home in on, which I think is, and this is, you said, speaking personally, and I'm asking you personally, not to sort of collect the yes. wisdom of the Bank of England, yes. enormous though that is, um, which would you personally prefer to see? What you described in this speech, which I quote, is a, a modern day glass steagall Act, mm -hmm. or the approach which the government is embarked on at the moment, which is embodying the Vickers ring fence. Which would you prefer? So um, I think in minimising the loophole risk, the, the points are made about where the boundary is and its clarity is important. I think if the ring fence is to work, the way it, uh, it operates is crucial. I would say the following ingredients are absolutely essential if this ring fence is not to prove permeable. Your one is entirely separate governance. The second would be entirely separate risk management. The third would be entirely separate balance sheet management, treasury management. We could not have debt issued out of a holding company because its cost would then be the blended mix of the two activities, right. Right. complete with implicit subsidy. Right. I would have completely separate remuneration structure. I think we ought to contemplate completely separate human resourcing if there is indeed this cultural issue that we've been discussing. I think with those ingredients, um, I would have a degree of confidence that many of the benefits of full separation could be achieved. With one, um, with one extra point, if I may, which is I was struck by the point made, I think by you, Chairman, uh, in the testimony provided by Martin Taylor, where you flooded the idea of having as a backstop, perhaps as a legislative backstop, the possibility of separation if the ring fence proves permeable or imp impossible to police. Uh, I think it's an idea that is worth thinking about. I can see some attractions to that from an incentives perspective. What it makes clear, I think, is that if for whatever reason the ring fence doesn't work as planned, the next step is not to remove it entirely, but to go with the next step, the logical next step in the words I used in the speech you mentioned. I think that could be, having not thought it through fully, that, that struck me as quite a, a clever way of ensuring that Vickers is implemented faithfully and achieves what it's meant to achieve. Put differently, what have the banks to fear in having that? The only reason they would be against that is if they planned to work round mm. or game the ring fence. Right. So for those that don't plan to do that, it's costless. Mm. For those that do plan to do that, mm. it puts their incentives back in the box. So that would be the, in the context of the bill that you're considering, I thought that was an idea that, that warranted some, some careful thought. And it's really the incentives, back to that incentives point, that that created would be very powerful for ensuring that the ICB proposals were implemented faithfully and delivered what they intended. One final question, if I may. Uh, leaving aside the point, it seems to me that your version of the Vickers ring fence, which is a logical one, uh, would produce a totally impossible governance problem. But putting that uh, to one side, uh, the speech that I quoted from you is called uh, on being the right size. And you made the point very powerfully that too big to fail was too big and we need smaller banks. Would not what you call a modern day glass steel be, uh, which they separate the universal, cut the universal banks in half, right? Would that not be one way, not the only way, 
of getting another volume, getting banks closer to what you consider to be the right size? It would, it would. I think it would be among the measures that could be taken to, uh, to tackle the too big to fail problem. I mean, another of the ones I mentioned in the speech that you, you quote there, Lord Lawson, which does speak to the chairman's point about competition too, um, is in Dodd-Frank, the US piece of legislation on the financial side, um, um, there is a requirement that no single entity has a deposit share in excess of 10%. That was actually in legislation before, US legislation before Dodd-Frank. That strikes me um, as an idea worth thinking about. One reason I think it is worth contemplating is because it hits two birds with one stone. It speaks to the competition issue by preventing the emergence of the cosy cartel, in your words, Mr. Chairman, uh, but also speaks to the too big to fail issue. I don't know whether the 10% set in Dodd-Frank is the right number for the UK, it might be, might be the wrong number. But it struck me as an idea that, given that it's already in legislation elsewhere, might bear some careful thinking about in a UK, in a UK context. That too would go in the similar direction to the one you mentioned. Sorry, uh, 